Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, today, uh, we have a very important hearing, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, everyone who is here and their uh, willingness to participate. The Select Committee has held more than 70 hearings over the last few years. Most of them have focused on the best of America innovation, new technologies, American entrepreneurs working to create new clean energy jobs. Unfortunately, today we must focus on a troubling issue, a fraud which has been committed on Congress. The subject matter of today's hearing is the fraudulent letters sent to Congress, letters that attempted to influence the vote on the Waxman-Markey clean energy legislation that passed the House in June. Our investigation has uncovered four main findings. Number one, more than a dozen fraudulent manufactured letters were sent to Congress questioning the Waxman-Markey legislation, letters that featured text written by lobbyists, doctored on fake letterhead, and marked with forged signatures from civil rights, senior, women's, and veterans organizations. Two, some here today will claim these letters can be attributed to a temporary employee when, in fact, this fraud chiefly resulted from a systematic lack of oversight and quality control mixed with a substantial disregard for the facts. Three, when the fraud was finally uncovered several days before the, uh, before the close affirmative vote for the Waxman-Markey bill, members of Congress who had received these letters were not informed of the fraud until after the vote had occurred. These events occurred within the context of a multi-million dollar so-called shadow lobbying campaign launched by the coal industry to influence clean energy legislation. Our investigation uncovered millions of unreported dollars spent on shadow lobbying by the coal coalition. The story begins earlier this year, in June, as the Waxman-Markey bill was headed to the floor. The American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, a trade association funded by coal giants like the Southern Company, Arch Coal and Peabody Coal, directed its PR firm, the Hawthorne Group, to manufacture a grassroots campaign questioning the Waxman-Markey legislation. This was nothing new. <clears throat> the Coal Coalition had been paying the Hawthorne Group at least $1 million a year for lobbying and consulting activities since 2000. In the first six months of 2009, Hawthorne was paid nearly $3 million by the coal companies for their work and more than $7 million last year alone. With two weeks left before the vote, Hawthorne was under the gun to produce results. They turned to Bonner and Associates, a firm with experience generating letters to support shadow lobbying efforts. Bonner and Associates, a firm that regularly hires temporary employees to generate these letters, immediately hired a temporary employee who, within his first few hours on the job, manufactured five letters from the Charlottesville chapter of the NAACP seeking changes to Waxman Markey. How was this employee so successful? Simple. The letters were forged. Did Jack Bonner or any other longstanding employee ask, how could a brand new employee get five letters in one day? Did, did they uh, ask why these associations, like the NAACP, suddenly uh, be willing to oppose the clean energy legislation? Did they ask that question? No. No one seems to have cared. Instead, these letters were simply sent to the targeted congressional offices without further review by Bonner and Associates, Hawthorne, or the Coal Coalition. Bonner and Associates has admitted they did not confirm the authenticity of the letters before they were sent to Congress, and neither did Hawthorne, nor did the Coal Coalition. 
Indeed, Bonner and Associates does not recall any conversations with Hawthorne or the Coal Coalition about oversight or quality control. But even worse, although the fraud was uncovered days before the vote, neither Bonner nor Hawthorne nor the Coal Coalition took any steps, steps to inform the affected representatives. In fact, they were not told until weeks later. The Coal Coalition was willing to pay millions to peddle a point of view, but they were unwilling to spend a few cents to call the U.S. Capitol and clear the air. This point of view was based on scare tactics and misleading figures and had zero to do with educating the public on key issues. These subterranean lobbying campaigns, where millions of dollars are spent in the cynical attempt to buy the support uh, ideas don't earn, have become a substitute for an honest exchange of views and distort the playing field away from other Americans longing to have their voices heard. Today's hearing examines how a process that takes place in the dark leads to fraudulent conduct. I have always believed that sunlight is the best disinfectant, and so we are here to see how this shadow campaign worked and why it went so terribly wrong. That completes the opening statement of the Chair. Now turn to recognize the ranking member of the Select Committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. <coughs> Sensenbrenner. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for recognizing me. Uh, let me say at the outset that no one appreciates frauds being perpetrated on them, whether it is the Congress and any of its members, regardless of party, whether it is corporations, and whether it is the American public. Uh, in this case, there was a fraud that was perpetrated on Congress, and no one can stand up to defend it. However, I think we ought to look at this fraud in the context of other frauds that have come up. Uh, with Bonner and Associates, they have recognized that one of their temporary employees committed a fraud. This temporary employee worked for them for all of six days. When they found out <coughs> that there was a fraud that was being perpetrated, they fired the person, which was the right thing to do. <coughs> they were under a contract with the ACEC and they did not bill the ACEC or they did not receive any payment. Uh, for the services that they rendered. So when the boss found out what was going on, he did the right thing, and he also said that uh, because of this, we don't want to be paid or, nor, or we will not accept any payment. Now, <clears throat> astroturfing, unfortunately, is an art that uh, apparently has been uh, really perfected, and it's been perfected on both sides of the aisle. I have a Business Week article from March 14, 2008, that talks about the secret side of David Axelrod. The Obama campaign's chief strategist is a master of astroturfing and has a second firm that shapes public opinion for corporations. And I would like to ask unanimous consent that this article be included in the record following my opening statement. Without objection, so ordered. Now, <clears throat> after the hearing that was first called by the chairman was correctly postponed because the rules were not followed, and I appreciate him recognizing that fact and postponing the hearing. There was another hoax that was perpetrated by people on the other side of the cap and tax issue, a group called Yes Men, and they perpetrated a hoax on the news media. Uh, they used the name of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to get a room at the National Press Club. Uh, they got a press release out saying that the chamber was changing its stand on the Waxman-Markey legislation, and it was only shortly before the uh, press conference supposed to st was supposed to start that the uh, chamber found out about it and went and canceled the press conference. Uh, but the damage was already done. And there were a number of media outlets, including the Washington Post and Reuters, uh, that ended up running the story based upon the hoax that was perpetrated on them. Um, I hope that this hearing, which talks about a hoax where the perpetrators recognize that they'd done something wrong,
fired the employee and didn't receive any payment would set an example up to those like the yes man and other people that might be thinking about uh, perpetrating hoaxes on important issues of public policy uh, to think twice. And maybe the yes men are thinking twice because the chamber has filed a civil action uh, against them um, uh, in the federal courts here in Washington, D.C. So I, I think what I want to say is that we're all unanimous in condemnation of hoaxes. Uh, this is one hoax that ended up uh, having the people responsible of uh, paying the price. The Yes Men hoax did not, and I would hope that uh, when we go forth from this, whether we're seated on this side of the dais, the other side of the dais, or those who uh, are representing the news media covering this hearing, uh, would be equally vigilant and equally condemnatory of hoaxes wherever they may come from, on whatever side the issue they are, so that uh, we can legislate based upon genuine public opinion. And again, I ask unanimous consent that the Business Week article about Mr. Axelrod's money-making activities be included in the record at this so point. Ordered. So ordered. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a very busy morning. I appreciate our colleague from Virginia joining us. Um, I just uh, would like to get on with the witnesses. I would, I would say that I, uh, I do appreciate sort of um, Congressman Perriello being an example of somebody who has, uh, sp uh, who has uh, the courage of his convictions uh, moving ahead notwithstanding uh, efforts like this to uh, distort public opinion and um, took a very courageous stand on a controversial <laughs> issue and continues to be engaged deeply with the public. And uh, the best antidote to, um, to cheating, um, I think, is a, a congressperson who is in touch with his constituents and his conscience. And I think uh, our colleague is a great example of that. And I appreciate him being here to uh, cast a little light on the situ unfortunate situation that he endured and hopefully uh, assure that uh, it is less likely to occur in the future. The right, gentleman's time has, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you calling the hearing uh, this morning. And I would want to associate myself with our ranking members' uh, comments and, and just add this. Uh, certainly, any time we have any fraud uh, perpetrated, whether it's members of Congress or at any level of government, it demeans the process, it demeans our democracy, our, our way of uh, governing ourselves here. And I would just say from a personal perspective, I, I've been involved in politics in an elected capacity probably for about 30 years. Uh, one of my jobs was a former, I was a former Secretary of State in the state of Michigan for eight years, and I was our Chief Elections Officer. And uh, I always thought then that transparency was best, and, and when I was trying to enforce campaign finance law, uh, there were many times that we would find, you know, shadow organizations that were trying to uh, drive a particular agenda or a particular issue. Uh, my favorite was always uh, lots of money going to a group called Good Government, uh, you know, and, and yet they, you, so you didn't know where the money came from, you couldn't tell uh, who was all involved in it, and yet they were trying to drive the legislature to, uh, uh, on a particular issue. Uh, I guess you can't, you certainly can't call that fraud, but yet it's not transparent. And it is trying to uh, achieve an end without full transparency. And I think it is very important uh, that all of us uh, in government and in Congress or state legislatures or city council or county commission or what have you, uh, we all find similar uh, situations. Uh, you know, we're always going to have the human element that gets uh, that it goes overboard in trying to drive a particular outcome in an agenda in an issue and uh, transparency is in uh, letting the sunshine in is always the best uh, uh, antiseptic I think for making sure that our democracy continues to be strong and vibrant uh, and certainly uh, calling attention to this issue today uh, is just one in many many things that uh, happen and always happen and will continue to happen but we need to always be ever vigilant uh, and those of us involved in the process trying to uh, shed the light, if you will, and sunshine on uh, people who are trying to drive a, a, an agenda. And what's happened here is unfortunate. This won't be the, it's not the first, won't be the last. And I think as members of Congress, I know on this particular issue, the cap and trade issue, um, my office received about 10,000 correspondence in various forms, uh, whether that was letters or uh, faxes or phone calls or emails or what have you. I would say about 70% of them were opposed uh, to the uh, 
the cap and trade uh, uh, piece of legislation. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's, people have to speak, but a lot of times you would get things and you'd wonder, you know, is it, who, did, did this person, is this a fraudulent uh, idea, is it, who is this group, uh, et cetera. And you just have to try to do your best uh, to weed through these, uh, these things. So, again, I, I look forward to uh, uh, the testimony by the witness. I appreciate, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, you calling the hearing, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. The general lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Just a, a note, if, if there's ever a fellow who represents the kind of Mr. Smith goes to Washington um, idealism and courage, it's the representative uh, who is before us today, and I really honor your work on this and other issues so far. I just want to make two comments. First, we have seen this movie before. And it was the exercise by the tobacco industry to try to hoodwink and cover up the science of the devastating toxicity that they were involved in for decades. And it actually worked for decades. And we have seen a similar effort to hoodwink and defraud and deceive the American public now to cover up the toxicity to the world environment and ultimately to our own health of carbon dioxide and other uh, climate change gases. And they have used every trick in the book, including the ones that we will investigate today. But I just want to note that they are now failing. The tobacco industry got its uh, comeuppance, if you will, and justice triumphed ultimately. And that's what's going on right now in the climate change debate, where you see in the U.S. Senate, members of the U.S. Senate on a bipartisan basis finally coming out to move on based on the science, which is now becoming dominant in the discussion. The second thing I want to note is that this is not the only continuing effort to deceive the American public. I want to, I want to note a book called Freakonomics, or Super Freakonomics, that some authors wrote that basically said, asserted we don't have to control CO2, we'll just pump sulfur dioxide up into the atmosphere and that'll solve the problem. They purported to quote a scientist named Ken Caldiera from Stanford, who's one of the predominant researchers in, in ocean acidification, to suggest that Dr. Caldiera didn't think we should control CO2, which is an absolute uh, deception. Uh, Dr. Caldiera, uh, I've spoken to uh, personally. He's told me we have to solve ocean acidification. You can't solve ocean acidification without controlling CO2, and yet people are still trying to write books to deceive the American public. And we got to blow the whistle on them. We're blowing the whistle on one today. We'll continue to do it uh, because ultimately science is going to triumph in this discussion. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, all time for opening <coughs> statements has uh, been uh, completed. So we'll turn to our first uh, witness, uh, who is uh, Congressman Tom Perriello, um, representing uh, Charlottesville and other um, communities in the 5th District of Virginia. Uh, he is in his first term here in Congress. He has uh, proven to be an outstanding uh, freshman congressman. And in the energy debate, he clearly has Congressman Inslee pointed out, has mastered this issue and has a true command of, um, of the subject material and an ability uh, to explain these um, uh, issues in a way that uh, had an enormous importance to um, the average citizen. So we welcome you, uh, Representative Perriello, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and respected members of the committee for providing this opportunity to speak today about the unfortunate tactics employed by opponents of the energy independence efforts here in the Congress. Uh, I will leave it to you and your committee to figure out where there are patterns of behavior, where there was deception of intent versus deception of omission. Uh, I can tell you simply my story of my experience with this uh, and what I've seen both in our congressional office here and in the district. It certainly has pained me to see so many upstanding groups, including senior advocacy groups and American Legion posts uh, misrepresented and dragged into this debate. Our founding fathers knew the importance of an elected representative body held responsible by the people and ensured that the right of the people to petition the government would be protected by the First Amendment. While politics has never been pretty, uh, there are certain lines you just don't cross, like the forging of letters, and this must be taken very seriously. You don't get into politics expecting a game of pinochle, but you do expect a basic ability to know the will of the people when they call your office, when they write, when they show up in meeting. And what I see here is a disservice not just to those who are advocating for the energy independence efforts, but also those who are genuinely advocating against. At the point that we have to ask deeper and deeper questions about how valid the phone call is, how valid the letter is, how valid 
the meeting with constituents are, we are undermining the effort of those on either side of the issue who take the time on their own free will out of their busy schedule to allow our elected officials to know their feelings. So I thank the chair for holding this hearing today to bring light to this important matter and give attention uh, as it deserves. My office, like many others, received a very high volume of constituent calls, letters, emails, and faxes in the weeks and days leading up to the final vote on the Clean Energy Bill. It is not only justified but admirable for citizens of this country to be so actively engaged in following such a piece of legislation, one that I believe will be one of the more transformative in a generation for rebuilding our competitive advantage and our national security. But while I hold strongly to the belief that this is key to the job creation and security of the next century, I also recognize that decent Americans can fundamentally disagree. Every member of Congress, regardless of whether or not they supported the bill, should value hearing from those who have deep concerns about the energy strategy of this country. This is the solemn and sacred duty we have as elected representatives. As my office worked to sort through the piles of correspondence after the vote, we were contacted by the Charlottesville-based organization Creciento Juntos, a nonprofit network that tackles issues related to the Hispanic community in my district. A letter, a letter from Tim Freilich, who sits on the executive committee, informed me that a partner with the lobbying firm Bonner & Associates had contacted Creciento Juntos to inform them that an employee of Bonner & Associates had faked a letter claiming to be from them. This faked letter was said to be a mistake, um, but Freilich, exercising his right of the people to petition the government for a redress of grievances, contacted my office to pass along the information about the forgery. This was the first my office was told of this uh, or any other fake letter, despite the fact that it now appears Bonner & Associates and the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity that had hired them knew about the forged letters before the final vote. I leave that to your committee to determine. After being notified about this letter, my office noticed similarities in the wording of the letter with others they had been sorting. Going back through the correspondences, my staffers found five more forged letters, these purportedly from the Albemarle Charlottesville branch of the NAACP. I would point out that the National NAACP organization did support the ACES legislation, stating that climate change disproportionately impacts communities of color and recognizing the economic and public health benefits of the legislation. Since the forged letters were, re were revealed, the National NAACP has said it is diametrically opposed uh, to the claims made in the forged correspondence. Since this time, other forged letters have been discovered, claiming to be from other groups, including two wonderful seniors organizations in my district, the Jefferson Area Board for the Aging and the Senior Center Incorporated, as well as a local American Legion post. Forged letters sent to other members of Congress have also been uncovered. Forgery and identity theft and attempting to influence members of Congress not only does a disservice to those who support the legislation, but also to those who oppose it. If members of Congress have to view voices of opposition with suspicion or doubt, it hurts the opposition's cause and our national debate on the whole. As for me, I will not change my dedication uh, to listening to my constituents and treating their opinions legitimately, uh, but clearly there are astroturf and other types of tactics uh, that are expanding, in my mind, a corporate capture of government. As the ranking member mentioned, this can occur on both sides of the aisle. But as we see more and more influence uh, of money and corporate influence in this decision-making process, the greatest antidote, the greatest counterweight is people power. Regardless of where the people are in the ideological spectrum, it is ultimately in a democracy, their accountability, that should matter the most. Where that is undermined uh, through such deceitful tactics, we all lose, regardless of our position on this particular bill. Again, I leave it to your committee to know where this was uh, patterns of behavior, uh, where this was one outlier. But the important thing is that we get to the bottom of this so that we continue to have the most robust and democratic public debate, not only on issues of energy independence, but all those that face us at this critical time. With that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman Perriello, very much. The Chair will recognize himself and uh, ask you, what was your reaction when you learned that letters, fraudulent letters, had been sent to your office uh, seeking to um, elicit a negative vote from you on the Waxman-Markey clean energy legislation as it was about to be voted on, on the floor of the House, uh, floor of uh, Congress? Uh, to be honest, at first there was very little shock. Nothing shocks me in this business anymore. I think we've all uh, probably on both sides of the aisle had negative TV ads run about us that we think have no bearing in truth and other things, and we just learn to be a little bit numb to it. 
but it was actually the visual um, that, that shocked me, seeing the actual taking of the letterhead um, and of such uh, respected organizations, both nationally and locally, um, that really did, uh, did shock me and say this, th this is a, a conscious level of forgery that's very different uh, than a lot of the uh, manipulations that go on in, in our politics today. Um, so if someone thought this was okay, um, either this was a really bad apple or there's some incentives that are very much in the wrong place here uh, that's driving this process and it seemed worthwhile to, to do our due diligence on the office side to see what else we could find. Well, in, in the short run, do you think that fraudulent activity as we have seen does help those who want to oppose legislation, clean energy legislation as it moves through Congress? No, I can't speak for other members. I know for me, uh, you know, when, when we try to uh, figure out where folks are on the bill, there's never consensus in my district. Uh, you want to use every avenue you can. You use, uh, obviously, the calls coming into the office. You proactively go and try to meet with groups. Many of the groups that are here are groups that I call on a regular basis to, to talk to and hear their opinions on things. So some of it seemed a little naive to think that, uh, that we wouldn't actually eventually have, uh, have those conversations. So, you know, each member is going to make their decisions in their own way. I think most of us try to consult our constituents and consult our <coughs> conscience, as Mr. Blumenauer said, and try to, to reach the right opinion on that. But it makes it that much more difficult to do it when, in addition to the normal due diligence, you're also trying to, to filter through uh, uh, things that are just outright uh, forgeries. But you were not notified before the vote, <coughs> NAACP uh, did not, in fact, oppose the Wax or Markey Clean Energy Bill. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. So as far as your office was concerned, they were in opposition. I would say that uh, if anyone knew that this was going on before the vote and didn't let us know, that's, that's certainly an issue of, of concern and, um, you know, so, it's something worth asking some questions about. Uh, but for me, yes, the, they, they did not approach our office uh, before the vote to correct the record on that. Uh, my time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. What have you heard from the perpetrators of this fraud? Uh, several of the, f the people involved in the chain have reached out to apologize uh, personally and, and profusely, um, and uh, I do appreciate that. Um, and uh, they have certainly uh, let me know that they have conducted investigations uh, internally. Um, and again, you know, I'll leave that to your committee to figure out um, uh, whether those have taken place, whether they're sufficient. But uh, I did appreciate them reaching out to apologize. Uh, I said to them what, what I will say to you, which is, you know, to me the bigger, um, you know, the really big picture here is uh, a little bit of what Mr. Inslee was talking about, which is we know we are in a, a climate crisis. I think we have taken a genuine effort to work with all the interested parties in this to protect stakeholders with a very slow phase in time with a lot of, of efforts to invest, for example, in clean coal. And to me, the most important thing is when you try to work together um, with all of the stakeholders to come up with a fair deal, um, it's then, uh, uh, you know, not entirely pleasing when the response to that is to, to be told it's Armageddon by the very groups that you were working with. But in terms of the fraud itself, I, I will commend them for taking proactive uh, efforts to uh, track me down personally and apologize. And when, when did they track you down and apologize? Uh, I don't remember, um, but it was about the time this started to break on the, um, uh, the, the Daily Progress, the, one of the, the top local papers in my district. You, 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 had, you, had, dis you had discovered it before. It, yes. And it was in the press before. My understanding is they had reached out to Creciendo Juntos uh, uh, on their own. That information had come to us. Um, the newspaper, I don't remember the sequence between uh, Creciendo Juntos talking to us versus the paper uh, publishing it, but they broke that story and it was subsequent to that that we were contacted um, uh, about setting up a, a phone call for that. So that you were contacted after this other stuff bubbled, you found out, and significant period of time after the actual vote occurred? Uh, that would probably have been, uh, you know, a matter of weeks, not days afterwards, but I can try to track down the exact time when those, uh, when that, those calls occurred. And did they give any indication why they didn't tell you this before 
the vote since they knew? Well, uh, the I think different people knew at different times, and again, I just I, I haven't done the, the 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 deepest due diligence on this. I, I know that's that's in your hands, but I think that uh, f that as these things are set up, uh, often there are six or seven layers between oh, um, the actual understand. actors and and the person who's forging right. the letter. So I don't think it's it's uh, at all. Um, uh, a stretch to say that some of the folks in that chain had no idea this was going on and didn't know until it, it broke in the papers uh, would be my guess. And I think there were probably some very decent uh, and honorable people who who got caught up in this and, and really regret it and were, were very serious about it. I think you know my best guess would be that there were others um, further down that chain who who knew uh, exactly what was going on. But you have an extensive background in working with people, advocacy, some uh, community, I, I hate to say, use the term community organization, but, but you have um, a, a background of working with groups like this to try and uh, articulate concerns, communicate them, solve problems long before you got involved in elective politics. So I would ask just uh, maybe your judgment as a semi-informed professional, uh, when you have groups that are tasked <clears throat> to try and create public uh, demonstrations, and it is outsourced, and it is, you, you mentioned layers upon layers, and we're seeing this, um, isn't it, doesn't it almost invite this sort of, it's just a matter of degree in terms of uh, uh, the more buffering, isn't it the harder to actually give an honest expression of, of what people feel and what they need? Well, at the risk of resorting to the you know it when you see it logic, I think that, that there is a blurring of that line. And, and certainly August was an example of that. Um, as you know, I did over 100 hours of town hall meetings in my district during August. Um, and the vast majority of people, uh, constituents who attended that were there absolutely on their own free will. They genuinely had uh, strong concerns either for or against the bill. Uh, against health care reform, um, about fiscal responsibility. Um, <clears throat> there were other folks uh, who were not uh, even from the district or other things, and there was obviously a lot uh, of orchestration on the talking points level. So how do you distinguish um, the genuine concern of people from some of these tactics? Where do you put, for example, things that just make it a lot easier for people to participate, such as calling and saying just press one and you'll automatically be connected to your congressperson? Well, that's a to in my mind, that's a legitimate, an absolutely legitimate and positive thing to be getting people connected. Obviously, if the information before that press number one is, is uh, false and you know scare tactics, then it sort of moves down that 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 line. Okay. So, from an organizing perspective, I think <clears throat> you know, getting most people care deeply about what's at stake in these debates, um, but most people are also extremely busy trying to find a way to um, provide for their families and where we can do genuine efforts to bring people together, as a, whether as an organizer or an official, uh, I think that's a positive thing for promoting public debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Congressman Perriello. I, I think that the work that you have done uh, in less than a year in office sort of uh, is, a, um, is, is a fascinating experience in, in being connected with constituents and even this unfortunate episode is, is useful and I, I deeply appreciate your contributions. Well, thank you. And, and again, you know, I do think uh, there, there are folks in the, the Clean Coal Coalition I, uh, who have been very active and, and positive and constructive in this debate. And I think as we, you know, we do look at this, we want to make sure we don't paint everyone with the same brush. We want, I, I hope you will be able to get to the real core of, of uh, you know, of, of what was at the base of this. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I really do consider this a, a serious thing because it affects not just you, but all of us in Congress when this kind of happens, it, that it diminishes our confidence and our ability to communicate with our constituents. So I do consider it con uh, a serious thing. Um, the, the, the research that I'm looking at as far as uh, the staff investigation suggests that not only um, not only sort of an underling of this organization sent these fraudulent letters on multiple occasions, not just one, but that supervisory personnel 
learned of this uh, fraudulent activity several days before the vote took place on the on the Waxman-Markey bill. On June 22 and 23rd, it suggests that the supervisory people at Bonner and Associates became aware of this. Then the vote took place a few days later on June 26, but there was not a, any attempt to notify you of the fraud till July 1st. It was not successful if effectively till July 13th. Has, has the companies given you any explanation why, even when supervisory personnel was aware of the fraud before the vote, that they waited until after the vote <coughs> to let you know about the fraud? Um, the, fo most, the people who reached out to me were from the, uh, the coal coalition itself, and I think their issue, if I recall, um, and I, I'm sure you can ask them, was that, that the information had not reached them before the vote, but I don't want to put those words in their, in their mouths. My, uh, I, I think that's just a question you'll have to ask them uh, in terms of when they knew and why they didn't let us know immediately. I think uh, everyone would agree that that's, uh, that's there. And, and, and also, you know, I used to do some war crimes prosecution work in West Africa, as you know, and the issue with command responsibility was always uh, not just whether uh, you ordered it, but did you know or should you have known that certain things were going on. And I think, you know, part of the question here is whether that concerns me is not just uh, what people knew, but were there incentive structures set up in which there was a, um, a looking the other way to, to encourage or incent uh, this sort of behavior that I do agree with you is extremely destructive to our democratic process? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that people who have been trying to obfuscate and deceive Americans about the clear consensus on the science of climate change Created, have created a climate where you could expect this type of thing to happen because they have on multiple occasions tried to deceive Americans into thinking there is not a consensus about climate change. And so myself, I believe this is, th they have created that climate where this kind of thing can be tolerated and happen in their organizations. And I think, I frankly, I just think this is just the tip of the iceberg on the deception that Americans have been uh, subjected to. Let me just ask you this, why did their efforts fail? Why did, you, why did you move forward on this vote of conviction? Well, <clears throat> I do think for all of the, the sort of corporate capture and, and uh, slick tactics that have taken over our democratic process, the voice of the people uh, tends to emerge. And I think what you see overwhelmingly from the American people is an understanding that energy independence is one of the challenges of our generation. Um, our country is being made less safe. Um, people don't like the idea that every time they go to a gas station, they're essentially sending their hard-earned money um, straight overseas to countries that don't like us particularly. Um, they understand that the energy is being produced elsewhere, the technology, we're being leapfrogged in these areas. I come from uh, the southern part of my district, has very high unemployment, old manufacturing areas, textile hubs, um, and uh, furniture factories. And we are looking for the next thing. And I think that for too long, we have had elites in both parties, quite honestly, pa pursue an economic strategy based almost entirely on the financial sector and banking and not on an industrial policy or an ag policy. I think, you know, when I started out in politics and took the, the step into this world, I conducted a couple hundred interviews with business leaders and others in these economically depressed areas and said, what can bring the jobs back? And people kept coming back to the energy economy over and over again, smart grid, decentralized power production, um, biofuel, biodiesel developments, all of these, as well as not only wanting wind and solar, but wanting to manufacture it there, also an advocate of, of nuclear power and some of that, those efforts that I think can, can be part of the solution. So all of that is there. And as you know, really good ideas often take 30 minutes to explain and only 30 seconds to destroy. Uh, we've seen that uh, in other debates as well. And I think at the end of the day, the way you break through this is to just work that much harder to be able to make sure you find the time to have the 30-minute conversation and not just the 30-second conversation. If you look at, uh, you know, not to be driven by polls, but the polling even in my district where I think uh, folks on the other side assume uh, this is, is going to be a very detrimental issue, people overwhelmingly support this. Um, and support a move in this direction. And I think the division people are going to see at the end of the day is the folks who, who had the courage to step up and solve a problem versus those who didn't. And I think it's the same courage issue 
you know, that you get at with whether, you know, your company comes right out and says, we don't believe this, or does the company create a coalition, the coalition hire a lobbying firm, the lobbying firm hire a sub-lobbying group that then hires a temp employee to do something. I think this is a time where we need to, you know, if you believe something, stand up, put your name on it, um, and fight for it, uh, wherever you come down on that issue. And I think that's the kind of leadership uh, that the American people are looking for. They don't expect to agree with you every time, but they expect you to look them in the eye and tell you well, what Well, it, it looks to me like they picked the wrong guy to bully. <laughs> thank you. Great. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired, and uh, Representative Perriello, thank you so much. And, uh, and we appreciate the fact that um, you're willing to come forward and to uh, make this presentation to the committee. I think it's a very important issue that we um, get out to the American people. Um, and uh, and it's, impo it's, it's important as well, as you're, you're uh, uh, pointing out to the committee, uh, that, the, uh, that the public has a right to the facts. They have a right to know uh, what the real truth is in the clean energy debate, but also how that debate is being conducted. And your testimony here today is very much appreciated, and, uh, and it reflects the excellent work that you've been doing here uh, in Congress for your district and for the country. We thank you so much. But thank you, Chairman. Now we'd ask the uh, next uh, panel of witnesses uh, to come forward, and we'd ask the staff to put uh, the names of the uh, of the uh, witnesses uh, in front of the um, <coughs> uh, the seats. President for Advocacy and Policy. The NAACP's Washington Bureau uh, is the Federal Legislative and Public Policy Division of the NAACP, which is the oldest and largest civil rights organization in the United States. He is the recipient of many awards and honors in the civil rights area. Uh, Mr. Shelton, we are pleased to have you with us here today. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Well, thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and other members of the committee for holding this important hearing and for inviting us here to testify. The NAACP sincerely appreciates the efforts of the committee to investigate this attack on the very integrity and the democratically structured congressional legislative process. The NAACP takes on our, our integrity very seriously. As such, we are outraged and appalled that anyone would fraudulently misrepresent our position as we pursue legislative opportunities to make our nation greater still. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, as we understand that the facts are these, just prior to the debate on the final vote on H.R. 2454, the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009, Congressman Tom Periello received a number of letters uh, purportedly from representatives of the Charlottesville, Virginia branch of the NAACP in opposition to the legislation. These letters, which had the official NAACP seal at the top, asked that Congressman Perriello support provisions intended to weaken the legislation. 
After the vote on H.R. 2454, the Congressman Periello office determined that at least five of these letters were forgeries, that they did not come from representatives of the NAACP Charlottesville branch, nor did they even represent the official policy position of the NAACP. Further investigation appears to indicate that the letters were sent out by a con consultant group that had been hired to represent opponents of the legislation. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, please allow me for the record to make one issue very clear. The NAACP supports many of the very important provisions in the American Clean Energy and Security Act of 2009, and we oppose amendments that would weaken these provisions. Secondly, we, uh, let me say that for more than 100 years, the NAACP has fought for equal access to our political establishment. For too long, the NAACP represented people in this country whose voices were marginalized, to say the least. That is why it is particularly offensive and infuriating to us when our name and all that we have worked for is misused and distorted by others in an effort to misrepresent or deceive the United States Congress. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it has been my honor and privilege to serve in the capacity of director of the NAACP's Washington Bureau for more than 12 years. During this time, I have endeavored to I have endeavored to build on the reputation of my predecessors and to dutifully and effectively represent the interests of the NAACP members from across the nation. As you may all be aware, the NAACP is nonpartisan. We do not support, endorse, or oppose individuals or political parties. We do, however, fiercely advocate for our public policy agenda and legislative priorities as passed by our members. As such, it has been my pleasure to work with members of the Congress from across the ideological spectrum on a myriad of public policy issues. For example, in the course of my tenure with the NAACP, I have worked with Chairman Markey on issues that include cleanup after Hurricane Katrina, making the change to digital television, and closing the digital divide. It has also been my pleasure to work closely with Ranking Member Sensenbrenner as he played a key role in reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act and his ongoing battles for the rights of disabled Americans. In all of these legislative battles, as well as in many others that we have fought and that we continue to fight, the political strength of the NAACP lay not only in our reputation, but also in the clarity and consistency of our policy agenda. To have somebody blatantly misrepresent the policy of the NAACP is therefore to threaten not only all that we have worked for for these past hundred years, but also to challenge our ability to continue to advocate effectively on behalf of our constituent members. Furthermore, because the NAACP has been working for the rights of disenfranchised and underserved communities for so long, our council is often sought by other organizations that represent similar groups of Americans. If our position is misrepresented, then it leads to confusion weakens our position and prevents our voices from being clearly heard on many crucial issues that affect our communities, our nation, and even our world. So the NAACP is looking forward to a thorough investigation by this committee into what happened. We will be especially interested in knowing if the practice of sending fraudulent letters in any effort to give the appearance of a grassroots movement is a common one. We will also be interested in learning that uh, what has been done what is being done to correct the misinformation and in, to mitigate any damage or fraudulent campaign like this may very well cause. I will say that from our experience, the first we heard of the misuse of our name was on July 31st, 2009, more than a month after the vote took place and only then from a media outlet. I am also curious to know if this type of fraud has been perpetrated using the name of the NAACP or any other organizations or individuals in any other instances. I understand that it is not the scope of this hearing to make recommendations on how to avoid future problems such as this. And frankly, I'm not sure I have any solid response that we can give to help address this issue in the future. However, I do know that we are very interested in working with the committee and the rest of the Congress in finding a way to continue to encourage honest, democratically based political activism by constituents and grassroots organizations, as well as other stakeholders, including industry and corporations. At the same time, we must strive to ensure that dishonest communications, which misrepresents the position of one or more of these groups, is stopped. And indeed, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shelton, very much for being here today. Um, our next witness um, is uh, Mr. Steve Miller. He is the President and CEO of the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, a trade association of companies involved in the production, transportation, and use of coal. Uh, thank you for being with us today, Mr. Miller. Whenever you are ready, please begin. If you could turn on your microphone, please. 
Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and other distinguished committee members. I'm Steve Miller, President and CEO of the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, ACE. I appreciate the opportunity to further assist the committee with this investigation into this important matter. For more than 15 years, ACE has worked to advance a constructive public policy dialogue on issues related to energy and environmental policy. ACE has publicly stated our support for federal carbon management legislation, and we recognize that a cap-and-trade program is one option for such legislation as long as the program provides continued access to affordable, reliable, and domestically produced energy. ACE supported changes to the Waxman-Markey Bill that would guarantee additional protections for consumers and the economy. We encouraged constituents to voice their support for measures that would limit the potential for significant electricity price increases. As a part of this overall effort, Bonner & Associates was contracted by the Hawthorne Group, our primary grassroots consultant for 10 years, to reach out to organizations in seven legislative districts. I'm appalled that some of the letters sent to members of Congress by Bonner & Associates were falsified. The sending of fraudulent letters to members of Congress or any other policymaker is simply unacceptable. Furthermore, it is inexcusable that members of Congress and the affected organizations were not promptly notified about these letters, and we at ACE should have taken more timely action to make these notifications. That's why we've taken extensive steps to investigate and address this situation. Nearly three months ago, we launched a full examination relying upon the considerable investigative experience of Venable LLP, our outside legal counsel. Former U.S. Attorney General Benjamin Civiletti uh, oversaw this review as a senior uh, partner of the firm, which led to three key findings. First, ACE did not play any role in the generation of the false letters and had absolutely no knowledge that Bonner had produced them until we were informed by the Hawthorne Group. Second, Venable examined the authenticity of all 58 letters submitted by Bonner. Bonner self-identified 12 as being falsified. Subsequently, our review questioned the authenticity of two additional letters. As soon as we identified concerns about these letters, Venable alerted uh, Select Committee staff and ACE notified the member's office. Third, Venable examined ACE's response after first being notified about the falsified letters in late June. At that time, ACE instructed Hawthorne that Bonner and Associates should immediately notify the affected members of Congress and organizations. But the investigation also showed that my colleagues and I at ACE should have acted faster to ensure that those affected had been notified before the June 26 vote on H.R. 2454. Our misplaced reliance on Mr. Bonner's firm to quickly make those contacts resulted in our own failure to act in a timely fashion. We've apologized to the affected members of Congress and the local community organizations. Following the examination, Mr. Civiletti made recommendations to the ACE Board of Directors. Based on those recommendations, the Board has taken or directed the following actions. First, three senior ACE executives, including myself, have been reprimanded and received substantial financial penalties. Second, ACE staff have implemented a public policy activity code of ethics that our board will review next month. All ACE employees, contractors, and subcontractors must abide by that policy. Third, ACE has informed Bonner & Associates that it will not be paid for the work performed and it will never work for ACE again. Fourth, ACE will recompete its primary contract for grassroots outreach. Any contractor bidding must comply with our new standards of conduct. Finally, Mr. Chairman, your letter from last week raised issues about how ACE discloses its lobbying activities. We disclose our direct federal lobbying expenses on the quarterly Lobbying Disclosure Act filings, consistent with how many other organizations on all sides of these issues report. In addition, we disclose our grassroots, federal lobbying, uh, state lobbying expenditures on our annual tax return. We will continue to accurately and completely disclose these activities as required by law. As we move forward, ACE will strengthen our commitment to a constructive, transparent, and authentic public policy dialogue that supports environmental progress, greater energy independence, and access to affordable, reliable energy to promote economic growth and prosperity. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Miller.
Our next witness is Mr. Jack Bonner, President and Founder of Bonner & Associates. Um, thank you for coming, Mr. Bonner. Uh, whenever you're ready, please begin. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Markey. If you could move that microphone over. Uh, uh, good, good morning, and thank you, Chairman Markey and Ranking Member Sensenbrenner for providing me an opportunity to set the record straight on what did and what did not happen during this most unfortunate matter. As founder and president of Bonner & Associates, I personally take full responsibility for what happened, for the improper actions of our temporary employee who fabricated more than a dozen letters to Congress in the names of organizations and individuals. While we certainly did not authorize or condone his actions, we also did not prevent them. I want to take this opportunity to publicly apologize to the three members of Congress who received the fabricated letters, and perhaps most importantly, to those organizations who, had, who were fortunately used by our former employee. I also want to apologize to Hawthorne and to ACE. What this individual did was wrong, and we should have caught him before he perpetrated his scheme. In hindsight, it is obvious that our firm and others would have been better served if we had avoided hiring this individual or preventing his fraudulent acts. But it is also clear that this incident was an anomaly, the result of an individual who, from the day he showed up, intentionally disregarded our procedures and instructions and was determined to engage in fraudulent activity. Although we still do not know what fully motivated him, Due to the serious implications of his actions, we referred the matter to the U.S. Attorney's Office. But let one thing be very clear. This improper activity was undertaken without the knowledge of anyone at our firm. It was the actions of one rogue temporary employee acting on his own, against our company's policies, and without the knowledge of anyone else at Bonner & Associates. Once we discovered the fraud, we took prompt action to notify our client and to immediately reach out to the organizations whose names had been used to apologize and explain what had happened. While we, didn't, while we did attempt to contact congressional offices to which the letters had been delivered, I should have personally taken immediate steps to contact those offices. While this was a fraud perpetrated against our firm, the manner in which it was done has demonstrated to me the need to develop and implement, in every instance, a more robust internal control system, and that is exactly what we are doing. We have developed and implemented a five-point action plan to earn back our reputation. All five corrective actions have already been implemented. Um, and they include one, action one, 100% 1 callback verification of all groups that have signed statements of support to elected officials before any letter is delivered. Action two, all temporary employees review and sign an ethics policy before their employment begins. Action three. All resumes of prospective temporary employees are verified by permanent Bonner & Associates staff before temporary employment begins. Action four, all new employees must complete an ethics training course and must pass an examination administered by permanent BNA staff to ensure the full understanding of BNA's ethics policies. Action five, BNA has retained an independent ethics advisor who is well regarded as maintaining the highest standards and independence. The Ethical Standards Advisor will review our policies and work with us to continue to improve our internal quality control system to the highest standards. I am pleased to inform you, sir, that Professor Dr. James Thurber, a leading expert in the field, has agreed to serve in this capacity. Let me now take an opportunity to explain the events surrounding the fabrication of these letters. On approximately June 10th, we were retained under a contract for $43,500 by a public affairs firm, the Hawthorne Group, to identify 
and attempt to solicit the support of veteran, minority, and senior organizations. One of the temporary employees we hired for this project was an individual responsible for the fabricated letters. His resume had appeared impressive and demonstrated bipartisan political experience and extensive grassroots advocacy. However, it is now clear that on his very first day on the job, June 12, this employee used fictitious names of officers and employees to generate five fabricated letters over the next, and over the next several days, he fabricated additional letters. When we discovered what had happened, our immediate reaction to this fraud was to advise our client, as well as to reach out immediately and apologize to the organizations whose names were used without authorization. On July 1st, we contacted offices of two members of Congress who received fabricated letters. After numerous attempts in the intervening congressional recess, it was not until July 13th that one of our staff finally succeeded in directly speaking with the congressional staff of Representative Perriello and Representative Dal Kemper about this matter, although it appears that Representative Carney's office, which received one letter, was not contacted. As I said earlier, we should have immediately contacted all three offices and immediately apologized in person. Finally, while we take full responsibility for what happened and recognize there were quality control and human resources improvements that need to be made, we have learned that it is difficult to defend against a person bent on committing fraud. I also know that all of us who play a role in facilitating public participation in the democratic process bear an important responsibility to ensure that process is free from unethical behavior. Because I recognize how important it is to the people to, uh, how important it is for people to be encouraged to express their views and participate in debate on public issues, I am committed to doing everything I can to make sure that something like this does not happen again. Thank you for this opportunity to answer and to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Um, and our last witness is Ms. Lisa Max. Uh, she has served as the Director of Public Policy and Government Relations at the American Association of University Women since 2003 the name and the letterhead of the American Association for University Women was misappropriated and used uh, on one of the fraudulent letters. Um, we welcome you, and whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey. And members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for conducting this investigation into fraudulent letters sent to members of Congress during debate over the Clean Energy and Security Act. I'm glad to be here today to address the troubling practice of astroturfing. What is astroturfing, you may ask yourself? Simply put, it's politically motivated public relations campaigns that try to create the impression of spontaneous grassroots engagement, hence the reference to astroturf. The goal of these campaigns is to, is to disguise the efforts of a corporation as an independent public relations action. These well-funded activities masquerade as people-driven movements, when in fact they are anything but. I know because I work for a genuine grassroots organization, complete with community-based advocates. Founded in 1881, AUW has approximately 100,000 dues-paying members and 1,000 branches nationwide. AUW was rec has recently been affected by the worst form of astroturfing. Bonner & Associates, a grassroots lobbying firm hired by ACE, has used AUW's good name in fraudulent letters to Congress. Ironically, energy policy is not even an area in which AUW advocates. A Bonner employee resurrected a now-defunct Charlottesville branch, used the AUW logo, and faxed and hand-delivered at least one letter to Representative Tom Perriello of Virginia, urging a vote against the energy bill. According to press accounts, Bonner, Hawthorne, and Ace knew of the fraudulent letters at least two days before the House voted on the energy bill, but neglected to inform the affected offices about the letters until weeks later, well after a very close vote. The scapego scapegoating of one employee is not necessarily going to solve this problem. Not only does AUW join in the call for an investigation by the Department of Justice, we also encourage Congress to reconsider legislation to address this shockingly legal but unreported practice of astroturfing. 
In 2007, there were attempts to include grassroots lobbying disclosures in the ethics bill, which would have required grassroots firms such as Bonner to disclose their lobbying expenditures and identify their clients. Unfortunately, this section was removed. AUW urges Congress to revisit this issue in the light of these re revelations. Our members are a conscientious, persistent, and outspoken lot, as probably one or, uh, or more members of this particular committee can attest. Perhaps the most pro poignant response came from Willa Lawal of Virginia. She wrote, as a former president of the Charlottesville AUW branch, I was shocked to learn from Gwen Dent, our past president, that the cited letter used her home address without her permission and cited the name of our dear lamented longtime historian, Ann Waldner, who died before the cap and trade issue ever came up. So not only were Bonner and associates engaging brazenly in, in theft of the AUW logo, they left the theft of address and identity was grossly insulting, end quote. So they used the address of one AEW member and the name of another AEW member who happened to be dead, also from a branch of AEW that was no longer in existence. One of the more disturbing elements of this mess was that Bonner never con contacted AEW directly. We confirmed with our Virginia State affiliate that they had been contacted by ACE, but since there's no longer a Charlottesville branch, our members were confused as to what was actually happening. When it was clear that there was no branch and that they were dealing with grassroots advocates rather than paid staff, Bonner and Ace should have immediately called AEW's national headquarters. Unfortunately, they did not. Instead, like the NAACP, AEW found out about our involvement in this situation in a way no one wants to hear such news in a newspaper. Because of our active membership, AEW is respected in Congress. Perhaps this is why corporate lobbyists used our good name to try to unfairly sway the outcome of the energy bill. AUW has a small team of ethical professional lobbyists to fight for our issues in Capitol Hill and in the administration. We approach our policy challenges as good, clean fights. I'd like to note as well that objections to the practice of astroturfing and the fraudulent letters that resulted is not about partisanship. It's about something much more fundamental. It's about who gets heard in the halls of power. This is about the fact that we, as a real grassroots group, don't necessarily have the astroturfers' resources and corporate funding. According to media accounts, A spent over $11 million in lobbying in the second quarter of this year alone. That's on pace to spend roughly $44 million for the year. AUW and similarly affected nonprofit groups spend a fraction of this amount. But what groups like us have always had is the honest, earnest voices of our members. When Congress receives a letter from our members, it's critical that they feel confident that they are being contacted by real people committed to the mission of AUW not a phony who is trying to undermine the principles of our representative democracy. If corporate-driven dri astroturf campaigns start corrupting the integrity of that commodity, the power of constituent voices, what tools are concerned citizens left with to improve our communities? Quite frankly, it's possible that other unrelated but just as fraudulent letters have been sent to the House and the Senate over the years. That is not a partisan issue, it's the reality, and it undermines citizens' confidence in their elected officials and their government. AW believes it's important to call attention to these unscrupulous practices in addition to protecting our good name. Mr. Chairman, I have a great job at an organization that has a worthwhile mission. We have worked for more than a century to build our reputation and keep our name untarnished. AEW members have used their collective voices to break through many barriers for women and girls. The notion that someone would come along and co-opt that name or attempt to harness that collective voice under false pretenses is a breathtaking and very personal deceit. I'm pleased to be here today and to add our voice to the call for reform. I welcome your, your questions. Thank you, Ms. Matz, uh, very much. We thank uh, the witnesses for their testimony. The chair will recognize himself now for a round of questions. Uh, Mr. Bonner, you learned of the um, fraudulent activity on June 22nd or 23rd of this year, um, four days before we actually had the vote on the floor of the House of Representatives on the Waxman-Markey bill. Why didn't you take action um, before uh, June 26, before the vote on the floor of Congress uh, to let the members of Congress know that the NAACP, that the university women were not in opposition to the clean energy legislation. 
Mr. Chairman. Could you again, could you turn on your microphone and move the yeah. um, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I am personally um, very sorry that I did not immediately go up to the three members involved, sit in their office until I was able to talk to somebody and tell them directly what had happened. Um, uh, we've put in place measures to make sure this never happens again, but should it ever happen again, whether I was asked by the client or anyone else, I should have been up there. We were wrong not to be up there. I should have sat there and made sure that the three members knew. We reached out to the organizations were, that were victims of this fraud to make sure we, that they knew about this, and we started that immediately. But the members of Congress should have been contacted. I take responsibility, sir, for not doing that. Now, why was it so hard for anyone who worked at Bonner not to meet with the members personally, but just to make a phone call? Uh, to let them know that you had identified the fact that the NAACP, the university women, were not in opposition. Those are not insignificant organizations in our country. Uh, that really does put a thumb on the scale against clean energy uh, technologies, uh, and uh, a word would spread uh, on the House floor as to why uh, particular members might be considering opposing the legislation. Why could a phone call not have been made from Bonner to those three members so that they and their staffs uh, would not be representing that uh, these very distinguished organizations uh, were in opposition to the legislation? Well, Mr. Chairman, we should have done that, and we should have gone beyond the call, and I should have personally sat there to make sure the message got through. Um, regardless of how little or how much effort that would have taken, it should have been done, sir. Did, did you know, did you personally know that the vote was taking place? Um, no, I didn't know when the vote was taking place. I do know when we discovered the fraud. And you are saying that you just didn't have processes in place at Bonner to notify people when a fraud was, uh, in fact, being perpetrated, and as a result, uh, those extra three or four days, the critical days before the vote, um, there was no notification of the members of Congress that the NAACP uh, was not in opposition? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, we're, we're a grassroots firm. We're not a lobbying firm. But having said that, we should have found a way to make sure that the Hill was notified promptly by us uh, immediately. We have put in place these five steps to make sure that that can't happen in the future because no letter will go up to the Hill until we have another person at Bonner and Associates, a permanent staff person, has um, verified that that letter is legitimate at the 100 percent level. No, level to, no letter to any elected official, Mr. Chairman. So you, you say that you didn't know when the vote was going to occur, but that was about as well advertised a moment in legislative activity as could possibly exist. A deadline had been set. We were going to have the vote uh, before we broke for the uh, 4th of July. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, earlier in that week, Bonner did uh, receive the information uh, that would have made it possible for those members of Congress to know that these very distinguished groups had not, um, in fact, uh, issued statements in opposition to the uh, legislation. So when you say you didn't know, um, what were the processes that existed inside of your company to ensure that when uh, fraudulent activity had been identified, that it would trigger uh, an immediate rectification uh, because it could have a profound negative impact on historic legislation passing through Congress? Um, the our, as I said, we're a grassroots firm, not a lobbying firm, so we weren't following precisely when that vote would occur. However, um, regardless of whether the vote was in 24 hours or three weeks away or whatever point in the future, um, I feel I personally have should have gone up to the Hill and made sure that members knew that, whether the vote was the next day or two weeks later. Well, we have a letter here uh, which uh, had been 
assent from your organization, from the NAACP, saying to the member of Congress, you are about to vote on important environmental legislation, the Waxman-Markey bill. Um, and it's signed here by Sheila Dow, NAACP, Charlottesville. Now, you knew by June 22nd or 23rd that this was not accurate. Uh, and that was internal information inside of Bonner. So what happened? Why didn't Bonner make this uh, public? Why didn't they uh, correct this mistake? Why didn't you uh, let Congressman Perriello know that uh, this was not accurate? This is no insignificant group in, in, uh, uh, in Virginia uh, in terms of its impact on the decisions made by a congressman in terms of how they should be voting. When, when we found uh, through our own quality control checks that the fraud had occurred, um, we immediately fired the person involved and we immediately informed the client. We should have also immediately informed the member of Congress. And why didn't you? Uh, the reason we didn't is we felt our first responsibility, um, uh, a, a, a responsibility of our firm as a grassroots firm was to get to the organizations involved in a very open way and tell them that we, Bonner and Associates, had made this mistake and that we apologized to these groups directly and that we, as soon as we had found that this fraud had been committed by this temporary employee, fired that employee. And we should have also, as I look back on it, sir, and as I look forward to the future, should have immediately informed Congress of it at that moment. Well, again, these letters were targeting some of the swing voters on this issue. And all reports for the preceding two weeks was that this was going to come down to a small handful of votes, determining whether or not um, success uh, was possible in passing the legislation. So the information that these members of Congress had in their office on the day that the vote was cast, June 26th, uh, Friday of that week, um, was that the American Association of University Women, the NAACP, veterans groups were opposed to the legislation, uh, which if they relied upon that could have actually resulted in the defeat of the legislation. So again, it goes back to the question of why didn't Bonner notify the members of Congress that this information uh, was inaccurate, that it had been manufactured, uh, and that uh, they should not be casting their vote based upon these misrepresentations. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we should have done that. Um, uh, it wasn't done for any other reason than we should have shouldn't we should have done it, and that our responsibilities were to make sure that the third party groups, the um, uh, community organizations who had this awful fraud perpetrated upon them were informed immediately by us, a lot, telling them our responsibility and Bonner and Associates' responsibility alone. Um, this was uh, something we were responsible for, and our employee did that, and he shouldn't have, and we should have caught it, and we fired him. Um, but and, uh, um, I would say from this experience, Chairman Markey, uh, we would, going forward, immediately inform the members of Congress. I have no knowledge of whether the members were swing votes or not. We're, we don't lobby. We just go and um, uh, get, or get advocacy work done. Well, th the reality is that they were. And the reality was that this was going to come down to a small handful of votes. And so, you know, miscommunication of information to these members. Uh, went right to the heart of our ability to have a, a debate on the, on the facts um, of whether or not this energy uh, legislation was good for the country or not. And so, again, organizations of this nature uh, uh, have a very heavy moral uh, and political influence in our country. So, Mr. Shelton, Mr. Bonner said that your organization, the NAACP, was notified as soon as possible. When were you notified? The vote was on June uh, 26. The, uh, the fraud was identified on June 22nd or 23rd. When was the NAACP notified? 
my office first heard about this on July 31st, which, and I, am the, I run the government affairs office for the NAACP that, is, that oversees all governmental interactions between the NAACP and the U.S. Congress. And we did not hear from any, any outside organization. We heard from news outlets asking us what we thought about the fraudulent activities that had occurred. So, Mr. Bonner, what do you have to say to Mr. Shelton about um, that long delay in notifying, notifying them that the, the good name of the NAACP had uh, been used uh, to, def to attempt to defeat uh, this uh, clean energy legislation? Um, Mr. Chairman, on um, June 29th, uh, one of my staff people had a very lengthy conversation of which we have a record um, that the conversation took place with the Vice President of the Charlottesville NAACP, at which time we apologized for what we did. We um, informed the, the Vice President of what went on, that Bonner & Associates was responsible for this, and we told her all about this. On June 29th, three days after the vote had occurred? Yes, sir. Now, what do you have to respond to that, Mr. Shelton? It is outrageous that very well they would wait that long to try to correct the record on a process that is so sacred to our very democracy, sir. Very well indeed it is outrageous, and they should be ashamed of themselves for carrying on this kind of fraudulent behavior. Okay. Ms. Matz, when did you find out that the use of your organization's name had uh, been uh, misappropriated and uh, used to attempt to, defend, to defeat uh, the Waxman-Markey Clean Energy Bill? Right. We actually, at the at National AW, found out even later than the NAACP did. It was the first week of August. Uh, and we found out uh, as a result of a newspaper article from Charlottesville. Uh, it was literally something that came up on a Google search, believe it or not. So, Mr. Bonner, what do you say to Ms. Matz in terms of that long delay, all the way from June 22nd to the first week of August? And this uh, organization, the American Association of University Women, still don't know that uh, uh, their name has uh, been used to defeat uh, uh, clean energy legislation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, what I would say to her is we should have found the national organization immediately. The person, uh, this temporary employee that did the fraud had actually made up a chapter that was no longer there, um, and we attempted to find that chapter in Virginia, and we didn't. Um, we should have contacted the national immediately. Um, when we talked on the phone, because um, uh, um, we, the AAUW contacted us, and I personally um, spoke and apologized for what happened and explained that Bonner and Associates was responsible and that we had fired the person involved, but we should have gotten a hold of the national organization right away, and I apologize for that. We, we wouldn't do that again. Ms. Matz, what is your response? Well, I, I find it regrettable that I had to be the one to reach out. Um, I do appreciate the fact that when I did, there was a conversation that was held. But there's a couple of things that, that I would question. Number one, as a grassroots lobbying firm, I find it hard to believe that they were not involved in the targeting of members because grassroots folks worth their salt do targeting in terms of figuring out who they need to spend their time on to try and influence votes. The other thing I would say is that not knowing when the vote is seems also a little disingenuous because how could you know when to stop doing your grassroots advocacy work if you didn't know when the vote was? Uh, so it seems, again, there's some disingenuousness going on here. And for our members, quite frankly, it's outrageous. The fact that they use the name of a dead member, the fact that this was someone who that particular branch had, when it used to be in existence, uh, was very highly regarded. Uh, you know, our members are incredibly distressed. One of the things that AEW relies on is not only a good name, but the fact that we have women who come up to the Hill every week that Congress is in session to talk to members of Congress. And the fact that they now are worried in some respects that when they go into an office that someone won't believe that this is actually our position uh, is incredibly distressing to them. Great. My time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Well, all I can say is give me a break that senior executives know about this defrauding Congress, but somehow, despite the fact that you're hiring lobbyists by the, by the army full, you can't tell us until after the vote that there's been this defrauding going on. Give me a break. Uh, 
Mr. Miller, would you agree that your organization, on behalf of a part of the coal industry, is partially responsible for defrauding Congress in this context? Uh, Mr. Inslee, the, the investigation, uh, the internal review done by Venable uh, and overseen by former Gener uh, Attorney General Civiletti uh, found uh, w without question that we did not have any knowledge uh, and did not in any way direct that fraudulent letters be done. Uh, the, the investigation further showed, however, that, that our reliance on Mr. Bonner's firm was misplaced. It was, we relied on him for basically three reasons when, uh, for our failure to act before the vote. Number one. Let, let me just for a moment. I'm just trying to get to kind of a yes or no and then I'll allow an explanation at the end. Do you think that your organization was partially responsible for defrauding Congress in this context? Uh, if fraudulent activity, no, sir. I don't, do not believe AC. Do you think you're partially responsible for misleading Congress in this context? I, I believe that our organization had an obligation, and now, based on, on uh, uh, three months uh, of, of thinking about this issue every day, clearly we had a responsibility to, to, to draw a line at a certain point before the vote. So this, the answer is yes. You were partially responsible for misleading Congress. Just we say yes or no. We are partially uh, responsible for the failure for the uh, affected members uh, to not be uh, notified. Well, let me suggest that this really is in a bit of the tip of the iceberg because I think you're responsible in a lot of other ways as well. I'm holding the talking points for ACE of phone calls that I'm told they're made, and it's about what you advise people to call and tell potential voters. Were you familiar with this? this uh, text to be used in these phone calls? Mr. Inslee, I, I don't have a copy of the particular uh, item that you have. I'd be glad to take a look at it. Well, it says, it, it talks about, um, this was from committee staff. I'll just read it to you. Um, because this is a whole nother issue of misleading Congress, frankly, that goes beyond even misidentifying who was calling. Because you paid an outfit to call and say this, have the caller call a citizen and say, how much do you pay for electricity? What would you cut out of your budget if your utility, bent, utility bill went from X to parentheses double parentheses every month? Would you write a letter to help stop that from happening? Close quote. You hired an agency that was apparently calling citizens, and I'll hand this document to me. I'm sorry I don't have it for you right now. I'll just give you the whole document in a minute. But apparently you hired an agency to call people and effectively tell them that, that something was going on in, in, in Congress that had the potential of doubling their electricity, which is just whole, wholly wrong and fraudulent. And this goes beyond simple misidentification who's calling. It goes to a deeper issue as to what you're telling the citizens. And it's consistent with all of your other ads you're running and all of these newspapers trying to scare the be Jesus out of citizens thinking we're going to be doubling uh, electrical bills as a result of Waxman Markey. And this is a deeper defrauding of the people in Congress beyond the simple misidentification. Uh, and I would ask you to respond to that. I'm going to ask staff to give you this and ask you and ask Mr. Bonner to take a look at this script. And first, Mr. Bonner, tell me, is this an accurate depiction of the script that your callers used as part of this contract? He'll hand it to you in just a moment here. Is that basically the script, Mr. Bonner, that your callers worked off of when you called people? Um, no, it's not the script that um, uh, uh, we used. Um, Are you familiar with that document? I'm sorry. Um, yes, it is. It is. Um, I'm sorry. It is original um, talking points that we used um, in our training. When we do calls, Congressman, um, we don't read a script to anybody. It's okay, well, let me just get to the heart of this. This is a training document. You told w your, your callers what to tell citizens. And in that document and in that training, you told them to tell the citizens that there was something going on or potentially going on that would end up doubling their electrical rates. Isn't that right? Um, well, I'm uh, reading it right now, uh, Congressman. Um, what, it says what would happen if their utility, utility bill doubled. 
So right, that's, and it's real right. clear that what you wanted to do and what this industry wanted to do is to, to scare the dickens out of voters thinking that some bill was percolating back here that would double their electrical rates, aren't I right? What we wanted to do was inform citizens their electrical rates could go up. You wanted to know them to think they were going to double. That's why you put it in your training document, isn't it? We said what the document. You, I mean, why'd you put double in your training document if that's not what you wanted your people to say when they called? The um, talking points uh, supplied by ACE were what we used as the model to talk, or supplied by Hawthorne, um, uh, were used as talking points to do that to communicate what was Right, and what happened here is Hawthorne, after getting their instructions from the coal industry, wanted you to try to convince citizens that there was a potential their electrical rates were going to double as a result of some legislation back here. Now, isn't that what happened? And I really like to short circuit that. Isn't that, isn't that what happened? Um, the talking points that we trained from does have the line in it, um, uh, what would happen if their utility bill doubled. Right. And that didn't come from a figment of your imagination. No, no, that no. came from information from Hawthorne that got their information from Mr. Miller's organization. Isn't that your understanding? Um, yes. Yeah, well, my understanding is Hawthorne gave Thank you. Now, Mr. Miller, did your organization suggest to the Hawthorne organization that in their calls or in other information give to citizens that it would be discussed a potential doubling of people's electrical rates? Never, sir. Okay. So your testimony is the Hawthorne administration apparently imagined this. Is that what happened? I, I don't believe so either, sir. And I, I would like to cite you to well, just if you can't help us, where did this doubling, whose idea was it to try to scare the citizens in believing there's doubling using your money? I, I believe that came from, from Bonner internally. And I would cite you, sir, to the, the, the filing that uh, the Hawthorne Group made with uh, the Select Committee on August 27th. One of the attachments to it is a, a full-page document that was uh, under penalty of perjury what uh, the Hawthorne Group says that they delivered to, to Bonner and Associates to, to develop their okay, work. Okay, so you believe Bonner and Associates came up with this doubling using your money, but apparently you didn't have enough good quality control on what you were trying to scare the citizens about to know that you were spending millions of dollars to try to convince the American public that there was a potential to double electrical rates. Isn't that what happened? We have never, uh, in the debate about the Waxman-Markey bill, ever uh, intimated directly, indirectly, that there would be a doubling of rates. You remind me of the guy who hired a hitman and said, just take care of the problem. Don't tell me whether you're using a knife or a gun. That is wholly irresponsible on your part not to give them and confine the information they were giving to the public. Don't you agree? Don't you believe that was wholly irresponsible by your organization? We provided to the Hawthorne Group a very detailed list uh, of, of talking points and suggested uh, activity. And Mr. Inslee, this is critically important. Our organization has never opposed the Waxman-Markey bill. And in the directions that we gave to Hawthorne to provide to Bonner and for the Hawthorne group to use with phone calls uh, that, that uh, they also oversaw, that we were seeking changes to the bill, particularly a limit on the price of emission allowances as they would be sold uh, in order to hold down the price of electricity. Okay. We have never uh, opposed the Waxman-Markey bill. We were seeking changes to it, and the record, uh, I think, very clearly shows that in regards to our filings before uh, this committee. What they gave the um, Congressman, if I could. So just excuse me, Mr. Bonner, I want to make sure I understand Mr. Miller's testimony. Uh, you're telling us that, okay. is it our understanding that you hired the Hawthorne Group and, and was there any information you gave to the Hawthorne Group that you authorized them to convey to the citizens as to the amount of in potential increases of their electrical rates? No. All it said that, that uh, and I can, can quote from our filing uh, with the committee yesterday to your, uh, your uh, uh, interrogatories from last week, um, th their script that, that the, the Hawthorne group uh, used for telephone calls, for example, uh, uh, stated that uh, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives is set to vote soon on a climate bill to change uh, to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Most everyone agrees the bill will increase energy prices. And I believe, Mr. Inslee, from every, almost every analysis that's been done by the EPA, by EIA, and, and other uh, government sources, it, it is clear that, that effective, strong climate legislation will increase to some degree 
uh, energy prices. So but you're telling me, you're telling me, you you don't believe, given the context of what happened here, that you spent millions of dollars both on lobbyists and on a public. I won't call it information. I think it's a disinformation campaign that they were telling citizens that it would potentially double their electrical rates. You're telling me that you don't believe that you were at least somewhat irresponsible in not confining the information that was purveyed to the public in this regard? I believe the information that we gave to Hawthorne to provide to, uh, to any subcontractors they use was entirely responsible. So you're telling me you'd do it again? No, you, sir. Well, let me, uh, I want to make sure I understand this. You're telling me that you don't think your group acted irresponsibly when it spent millions of dollars that ended up trying to scare people into believe their electrical rates could double without telling them, no, you need to tell the truth. You would do that again, knowing what happened here, and not make sure that the people were told to tell the truth, not to try to scare them into this thing that their electrical rates were going to double? Part of the, of, of the new uh, code of ethics that we've put in place codifies the rationale that we used in, in providing this information to Hawthorne, but we're going to require now contracts not only between uh, ACE and Hawthorne, but any contractor we have with subcontractors that require that those subcontractors use only materials that have been prior approved. So you're telling me you won't do it again then? We're taking extra measures to make sure that the legitimate public policy uh, uh, items and information and requests to make changes to legislation rather than to vote against it. So I want to make sure you understand. You're not going to go out and tell citizens or try to make them believe that their electrical rates are going to double as a result of this legislation. Is that correct? ACE has never done that sir, in regards to this legislation, and we, I cannot imagine that we would do so again unless, uh, unless a, a truly uh, valid analysis showed that whatever proposal was in place would in fact do so. But that's Well, not okay, we, we agree that there was some wrongdoing here, and the question is what is penance? And I want to make sure I understand it. On June 25th, as we were preparing to look for the 218th vote to pass the Waxman-Markey bill, did your organization uh, have lobbyists working Capitol Hill? We did have lobbyists working Capitol Hill to seek changes to the legislation, particularly for a safety valve to try to, to put an upper limit on the price of emission allowances to hold down electricity prices. And pending that uh, change, were you advising members how you wanted them to vote? We were seeking changes. We, we did not. So let me, let, me, let me hit that question straight on. We did not seek uh, members voting yes or no on this bill. It was the judgment of our board that we should be continuing to try to seek changes, not only uh, for a safety valve, but other aspects of the bill that we thought needed to be changed. And at no time did our contract lobbyists or did we direct anyone uh, on staff or any consultants that work for us to seek votes to oppose the Waxman-Markey bill. Mr. Miller, we, we, we do agree, I think, there was uh, misfeasance or malfeasance here. And again, I want to just briefly ask you what you believe the appropriate penance is. When an organization does something wrong and you've agreed they've done something wrong, and the question is, how do you make it right? What's the appropriate penance? Uh, right now, your organization is running millions of dollars of ads suggesting that the current Waxman-Markey bill, I, I think, is, is not to your liking, the best way I could categorize it. You still have lobbyists on the Hill. Let me just suggest, don't you think, as a first step, that you direct your lobbyists uh, to talk to, for instance, Senator Inhofe and tell him, look, Senator, this is a real problem in America. Climate change has real potential cataclysmic consequences. Our industry believes that we have to deal with this. We need to limit carbon dioxide gas. And you are simply wrong in saying that this is some you know, fiction of rogue scientists. Now, don't you think that's some penance that your organization should do? Let's start with Senator Inhofe. Uh, our, our organization, our board, has very clearly stated for two years that we support a federal carbon management uh, program as a matter of federal law, and that a cap and trade uh, provision could be the, is one option for that. So we clearly recognize that 
carbon management legislation and federal legislation in this area is a desirable uh, action by this Congress, so long as it is reasonable. And so we, we take that message, Mr. Inslee, to Democrats, Republicans, uh, across the board. And so whether it, it's Mr. Inhofe or whether it's members of the House, we are methodically working through the members of Congress to say that our organization supports federal carbon management legislation that could include a mandatory cap and trade. So, Mr. Miller, do you think it would be proper partial penance for your organization when you leave this hearing to call your lobbyists and tell them to go talk to Senator Inhofe and tell them that your organization believes that we have to limit CO2 because it has potentially catastrophic impacts on America, number one, and number two, maybe run one ad saying that, that we've got to have, in fact, CO2 limitation or we're in deep trouble. Now, don't you think those are two things that you ought to do and will do? I'll just ask you simply. Yes. And if I may address this. Is that a yes to both? I, 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 we will speak to Mr. Inhofe as we will all 100 members of the United States Senate that our organization supports federal carbon management legislation and that a mandatory cap and trade can be part of that. We will do that. You have that commitment that we will we will touch base with all 100. We've, we're well on the path to okay, doing Okay, that's that one. Will you run some ads in the Hill rags talking about the fact that we need CO2 regulation in this country uh, as a lead title? Right. Uh, will you do that? Sir, I, I, I'd be happy to submit to this committee copies uh, of advertisements, print advertisements. Oh, that's great. I just want to ask you one more question. I'll let you go. I've gone well over time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Will you run an ad as partial penance for this transgression, a thing that says at the top, we need CO2 regulation in America and we need it fast? Will you do that? We will continue to run ads. And I would suggest, sir, that if you have the full range of ads that we've run this year, we have said that our organization supports federal carbon management legislation and we are working to make that legislation be correct legislation. I, I don't know if that's a yes or no. It's the best I'm going to get. I suggest you think about that. I think it would be a responsible thing for you to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen's Congressman, time, if, I, gentlemen's time has expired. Well, just if I could just jump in here real quickly. I, I think we need to be really clear about what happened. Basically, it was an argument about increasing the rate, doubling the rate, that was targeted in the districts of swing members that was then targeted in terms of the organizations that were affected, that were forged, to African Americans who are discriminated in all sectors of society, to seniors who live on fixed incomes, to women who make 77 cents on the male dollar, groups who are absolutely going to be scared by an argument that their electric rates are going to be doubled. And then those letters from groups that represent those constituencies were forged and sent to members of Congress who were on the fence about this particular bill. I think that is something that you really need to take into account in the sense that this was calculated and this was deliberate. This was a strategy employed to try and influence members of Congress from the very people who uh, their particular fraudulent argument was going to be the most persuasive with. Thank you. And we thank you, Ms. Matz, for that. Uh, to the gentleman from Washington State, there are two roll calls on the floor, but I intend on returning after those roll calls to continue this hearing. Let me just follow up with what Mr. Inslee just said. Um, Mr. Miller, your, your organization is one that has been advocating for funding for uh, technologies that can put the pollution, which is created from the coal industry, and by the way, 40 percent of all greenhouse gases, all of this pollution comes from the coal industry. So actually, if we can't solve the problem of coal and the ro role that it plays in creating um, this climate change, then we can't solve the problem. And so you and your organization have advocated for funding to uh, put this pollution underground, to find ways of uh, keeping it uh, from ever going into the atmosphere. And that underground strategy is something that uh, is something that you've advocated. But at the same time, you have lobbying activities which you fund, which is similarly kept underground. Uh, uh, there are uh, organizations that you hire that hire other organizations that then result in Mr. Bonner uh, hiring temporary employees uh, who are uh, sending out information that says there will be a doubling of electricity rates if the legislation 
uh, moves uh, forward, uh, that there will be great harm that comes to minority groups, to women, uh, to seniors in our country if this legislation goes forward. Uh, and uh, that is part of the campaign as well. Well, there is a big difference between advocating for modest changes in legislation and sending out uh, information like that that is then repeated by senators and uh, other members as though it is true, uh, when in fact the information uh, that is developed all emanates from uh, the uh, coal coalition that hires a contractor, that hires a subcontractor, that hires a temporary employee, that is then spreading that information uh, to individual members. Uh, as Mr. Inslee is saying, they don't get the message uh, that you support clean coal technology, that you want legislation to pass that effectuates that goal. You are sending out just an, the opposite message. You are saying that if this strategy is adopted, it will double the rates of electricity users in our country, which is completely false. Your advertising doesn't reflect that. The message that you send, either using this methodology, this subterranean, this uh, underground uh, methodology that you use to uh, lobby Congress, doesn't tell members that, doesn't tell the public that. And your ads that are in, pu that are in public don't say that at all as well. It makes it seem as though it is a very scary, expensive, dangerous prospect for the American economy and for these consumers. And so if you are stepping back, Mr. Miller, and you are looking at what happened here, you are saying, we, the, the average person would just say, well, that is coming from a very reliable source, from the coal coalition of our country, the source of electricity in my home, they are saying to themselves. Huh? And unless that mis um, interpretation, that misrepresentation is corrected, then they are going to assume there must be some validity. And the proof in that is that Senators and members of the House of Representatives repeat it as though it is true. And so that has a profoundly negative impact on the legislative process. And uh, ultimately, it comes back to you, Mr. Miller, uh, because you are the funding source, ultimately, for this message as it is uh, transmitted to the American public and to the Congress. So this is your moment. This is your opportunity here to make it clear that you are going to ensure that the positive message uh, is out there uh, and that you will correct the misinterpretations. Uh, as the, as Waxman Markey is, is uh, evaluated by the Congressional Budget Office, by the Environmental Protection Agency, it is clear that it costs no more than a postage stamp per day uh, for the public in order to implement it. But if, if people hear it will double their electricity rates, uh, if people hear that it will have a profound negative impact on the economy, then of course, and using organizations like the NAACP, like the American Association of University Women, of veterans groups and senior groups across our country, well, they are going to believe that this is accurate. So what do you have to say to us, Mr. Miller? How do we correct this? We correct this in a number of ways. Number one, in, in the exchanges that we are having right now, I am trying to be very clear and accurate in regards to what we have said in our advertising and requests that we have made for uh, uh, contacts to be made and suggestions for contacts to be made with policymakers, that we, our organization, supports federal carbon management legislation that could include a mandatory cap and trade, that that legislation needs to have key components to it, one of which are very strong measures to make sure electricity price do not surge because of this, and that, that our advertising has said that, the direction that we have given to, to our consultants, that Mr. Bonner's firm, apparently, from, from what I am reading here, did not follow. Even, uh, uh, Mr. Markey, I would cite that on the day that the, that the Waxman-Markey legislation uh, passed uh, out of the House uh, Energy Committee, we issued a press release in my name, which I approved, which said uh, we look forward to working with the members of the House of Representatives uh, uh, going forward. And at the end, we want to commend Chairman Waxman, Chairman Markey, Chairman Dingell, and Chairman Boucher for their leadership in making important changes to the discussion draft of this bill. We have been publicly stating that 
the, that the bill needed changes, and we still believe that as it, uh, it has been used as a basis for much of the Kerry Boxer bill that it needs changes, but our organization supports federal carbon management legislation. One of the reasons being, as you correctly stated a few minutes ago, we will not solve the challenge of climate change globally unless there is an effective carbon capture and storage technology program that, that spreads uh, for broad-based commercial uh, use around the world. And the sooner we can get to that, the sooner we will be dealing with one of the major, major challenges for climate change. So we are speaking four aspects of this very clearly and will continue to do so. One change, though, one reform in our code of ethics that, that our board will formally act on in about three weeks and that we're uh, implementing now as an interim measure, we are going to insist in all of the contracts that exist that our consultants, our contractors, their subcontractors only use scripts that we have seen and absolutely approved. Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller are you ashamed of how the Coal Co Coalition has been represented uh, by Hawthorne, by Bonner? I, I am out, I said, I used the word outrage on day one, and I am outraged here that the clear direction that we provided Hawthorne that was then, according to the documents filed with this committee, then passed on to Bonner and Associates All right, then let's not make, filed. Then let's, wor let, let's we're going to, I'm going to take a brief recess right now, uh, and we'll return, uh, Mr. Miller, so we can continue to have this conversation. Yes, sir. About the way in which the coal uh, industry represents this entire debate to clean up our, our atmosphere. The, the, the committee will stand in recess for uh, 10 minutes.